It's been an exciting week in the Jenkins household. This week, my daughter announced her engagement. I was thrilled to be included in some planning and scheming with her fiancé as he made plans for the proposal. And now it's happened and she said yes. Together, thank you, together we thought about who we should tell first and how we would do that. We made sure that our families and close friends heard the news before it was announced to the rest of the world. I'd been thinking about that and the contrast between our announcement and the announcement that God made through the angels so long ago. When God chose to share good news with the world, he didn't start with that kind of very small list like we had, close friends and family, he started with the most unlikely people. He started with what seemed like some random shepherds. You would think that news as important as the birth of the Messiah, the Son of God, would be given to important people, religious people, a priest in the temple or a prophet in the synagogue, but shepherds? Who knows when they last set foot in a synagogue? Luke says nothing about them being religious people or spiritual leaders or even educated. He says nothing about them having homes or families or much of a livelihood other than looking after sheep. Chances are they probably smelled a little bit like sheep too. They were not wealthy, they were not high on the social ladder, they were not social influencers. It seems like they didn't have much going for them to be the first on the announcement list. Yet it was to these humble shepherds that good news was given. The angel messenger said, I have come to bring you good news, the most joyous news the world has ever heard, and it is for everyone everywhere. For today in Bethlehem, a rescuer was born for you. He is the Lord Yahweh, the Messiah. You will recognize him by this miracle sign. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a feeding trough. Perhaps it was the shepherd's humble circumstances. Perhaps it was their humility that enabled them simply to welcome the message without the analysis and scepticism and doubt that we might apply to such news and to such an encounter. It was these ordinary people who grasped the glory of God. They said, let's go, let's hurry and find this word that is born in Bethlehem and see for ourselves what the Lord has revealed to us. Perhaps it was their ordinariness that enabled them to embrace the wonder of the presence of God without scrutiny and the hesitation and distrust that might emerge in us had we received such news. Whatever it was, they were chosen to be the first on the list and they were among the first to see the Christ child. Simple shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. Mind you, watching over a flock of sheep may not have been the easiest of tasks, especially near Bethlehem. The hills around Bethlehem are rocky and steep and unpredictable, and darkness would make the task somewhat dangerous. And then there was the cold to contend with. But these shepherds had coped with changes in the weather and negotiated the terrain and dealt with wolves or thieves prowling in the night. They had probably seen all sorts of things on their night watches and had fought off many dangers to protect their sheep. 
They were skilled at it. I, may, I imagine that they would not easily be scared. Challenge and danger were part of a shepherd's life. But on that night, it wasn't a challenge or a danger or a threat that captured their imagination and caught them off guard. That night, it was something quite different. The sky blazed with light. It shone with the brilliance of God's glory and radiated across the fields as the angel appeared before them and spoke to them. Luke says these burly, brave shepherds were terrified. And yet, when the angel spoke and told them what had happened, they welcomed and embraced the message and did not hesitate to go and find the child. They cut short their night shift. They altered their priorities. God had revealed his plan to them. A rescuer, the Messiah, had been born, and they hurried off to see for themselves. I wonder how they found their way. Presumably, once the angel choir had packed up, the sky was dark again. And what happened to the sheep? They simply left them. And how did they know Mary, or how did they know where Mary and Joseph would be? At that time of night, who could they ask for directions? And how would they know the location of the exact manger? There must have been so many feeding troughs in Bethlehem. And why, oh why, would a baby named as the Messiah be resting in a manger anyway? So many questions. And Luke, in his gospel, is short on answers. He doesn't really give us too much information. But what he does tell us is that the shepherds found Mary and Joseph and their newborn child. And just as the angel said, he was lying not in his mother's arms, but he was lying in a manger. And having seen for themselves, they told the story to anyone who would listen. And everyone who heard the angel's story, says Luke, was astonished by what they were told. These unnamed, rugged shepherds heard the herald angel, and then they themselves became heralds, heralds of hope, freely sharing the good news of the birth of the Christ child with everyone. I wonder if there have been moments in your life when it seemed as if God has burst in. Maybe not with angelic beings or blazing light, but there has come for you an awareness of the presence of God. A song or a line from Scripture has come to mind just at the right time that has brought you comfort or a kindness has been offered just when you needed it, or a peace has settled over you in the midst of fear. And that awareness has flooded your life with light and love. James, in his letter, says that God still comes to the humble. He said, God resists you when you are proud but continually pours out grace when you are humble. How have you responded in those moments when you've become aware of God's presence? The shepherds left their work to celebrate the presence of the Messiah. Well, we might not have that luxury of time, or we might find ourselves in trouble with our employers or colleagues or clients if we were to simply kind of walk out. But celebration can simply be a moment, a moment in which we pause to consciously acknowledge God's presence and simply say, thank you. 
It could be at that a moment, a moment of awareness, or it could be later as we look back over our day and notice God's hand on our lives. It's true that the more we celebrate, the more we see to celebrate. Our eyes become focused and alert to the presence of God all around us. The psalmist in Psalm 62 said, God's glory is all around me. His wraparound presence is all I need. For the Lord is my saviour, my hero, and my life-giving strength. Having seen for ourselves, having taken that moment to celebrate and to praise, who are you sharing your story of God's presence with? And how are you heralding the hope you hold with others. Paul asked in his letter to the Romans some really pertinent questions. He said, how can people call on him for help if they've not yet believed? And how can they believe in one they've not yet heard of? And how can they hear the message of life if there is no one there to proclaim it? And how can the message be proclaimed if messengers haven't yet been sent. That's why the scriptures say, how welcome is the arrival of those proclaiming the joyful news of peace and the good things to come. The shepherds became part of the ongoing story of God as they shared their experience with anyone who would listen. And amazing as it may seem, to us, we too are invited to become part of God's story, part of the ongoing story of God's love for humankind, as we are invited to offer his love and presence, his joy and peace as hope for our weary world. May God help us to do just that.